people are still joining. As you come on, if you'd like to put your name in the chat and where you're joining us from, we'd love to see who's here. Welcome all. My name is Kirsten Faulkner. I'm the Executive Director of Historic Hawaii Foundation. We're so pleased to be hosting our 37th Annual Experts Historic Preservation Lecture Series. I'd really like to thank our event partner, Dr. Ralph Cam. Um, he's the curator of the Experts Series. Dr. Cam is the Executive Director of Hawaiian Mission Houses Historic Site and Archives. He just started in that new position a few months ago. Um, and this series is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Graduate Certificate Program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa School of Architecture, as well as Historic Hawaii Foundation. This year's theme is um, Pioneers of Preservation. Um, and today's presenter is going to talk about Nancy Bannock as our first talk. Um, the Oh, just a quick note, all of these lectures are being recorded. They're also being live streamed on the Historic Hawaii Foundation YouTube and Facebook pages and you can view and share those afterwards as well. Use the chat box to type in your questions. We'll try to answer those as we go. And then also at the Q&A portion at the end, we'll try to address as many as possible. This year's theme is in honor of Historic Hawaii Foundation's 50th anniversary. We decided to explore the history of historic preservation by sharing the stories of some of the people and organizations who helped ensure that Hawaii retains its sense of place, of history and of community through their commitment, advocacy, and perseverance. So each week we are going to highlight and share some of those stories. We wanted to start with setting the context for historic preservation in the United States. Going back to the 19th century, the history of the preservation movement is commonly tied back to the Mount Vernon's Ladies Association. This group formed in 1853 with the purpose of preserving Mount Vernon, the home of America's first president, George Washington. I do find it somewhat notable that Mount Vernon was built in 1774 and was threatened with hotel development less than 80 years later. I think that's worth remembering when some of our own elected officials or developers try to claim that nothing in Hawaii is or can be historic unless it is at least 100 years old. Um, clearly, that's not the case, but, you know, we all need to be reminded sometimes. For many years, the national preservation movement was primarily marked by actions of wealthy, usually white, landowners working to preserve buildings that were associated with wealthy, usually white, landowners. These early days of preservation are often characterized as the mansion on the hill. These were important efforts, but they did not encompass the fullness of the people, places, and events that are part of collective stories and histories. We started to see that change in the early 20th century. The 1906 Antiquities Act established a process by which the president could declare national monuments, including those with natural, historic, cultural, and scenic significance. Many of these places are sacred to indigenous peoples, such as Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Then the Organic Act of 1916 established the national park system and the ability to designate and manage public lands for their natural, historic, cultural, and scenic values in a spirit of stewardship for all people. The 1935 Historic Sites Act established national historic landmarks as a way to recognize important places on both public and private lands. And then the capstone federal law is the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act which established a nationwide policy for preservation through partnerships at the federal, state, and local levels, with a goal of encompassing history and historic places important to a wide diversity of experiences. It established the National Register of Historic Places, including buildings, sites, objects, and districts. This moved the preservation movement beyond the mansion on the hill to ensure to, that everyone's history is included and important. A similar pattern played out in Hawaii. One of our lectures this year will explore the wonderful work and origins of the Daughters of Hawaii. This group of women worked to save the Queen Emma Summer Palace in 1915, when the city of Honolulu proposed to demolish it to build a baseball field. The Daughters took their success and applied it to Hulahe'e Palace to restore it in the 1920s. And around this same time, the Hawaiian Mission Children's Society restored its 100-year-old buildings and fended off development pressures in the downtown core. So these are all important early efforts, but again, they were sort of mansion on the hill um, in, in their approach. 
But again, moving beyond that mindset, Hawaii started to encompass a greater range of sites, stories, people, and events that were considered worthy of remembering and protecting. After World War II and as Hawaii became a state and saw a vast building boom, there were growing concerns that places of antiquity and community character were being sacrificed to the boom era. In the 1960s, a growing grassroots movement started to push back. Areas important to Native Hawaiian culture and history were formally listed as National Historic Landmarks, including the Mauna Kea Ads Quarry and the Honokohau Settlement. A short-lived proposal to demolish Iolani Palace to build a parking garage for the new state capital was firmly denied. And a strong advocacy for saving Honolulu's Chinatown came about in response to demolition of blocks and blocks of the traditional area. That story is the subject of today's lecture. It's interesting that the preservation movement in Hawaii was part of the larger movement for cultural revitalization and environmental activism. The early 1970s saw the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, as well as the National Historic Preservation Act. The early 1970s are often called the Hawaiian Renaissance because of the renewed interest and support for Hawaiian culture. This was the time of the effort to stop the bombing and restore Kaho'olawe, to, re to rediscover traditional voyaging with the Hokulea, and was also the start of Historic Hawaii Foundation. One of our first projects was to help prevent the demolition of the Rainbow Bridge in Haleiwa, which the Department of Transportation planned to replace with a four-lane highway. It was out of that broader societal movement that Historic White Foundation was born. Incorporated in 1974, we're proud to have served White's interests for half century to encourage the preservation of historic buildings, sites, structures, objects, and districts that relate to the history of Hawaii. In short, we say we help people save Hawaii's historic places. Before I turn the time to our speaker, I want to highlight some of the underlying values that were captured in that movement. The work that resulted in the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 included these thoughts. Buildings which express our heritage are not simply interesting. They give a sense of continuity and of heightened reality to our thinking about the whole meaning of the past. The preservation movement must go beyond saving bricks and mortar. It must go beyond saving occasional historic houses and opening museums. It must do more than revere a few national shrines. It must attempt to give a sense of orientation to our society using structures and objects of the past to establish values of time and place. That was really the underlying thought behind Saving Chinatown. And to tell us that story, our, today's presenter is Robin Lung. Robin is a fourth generation Chinese American from Hawaii with an 18 year history of bringing untold minority and women's stories to film. She made her directorial debut with Washington Place, Hawaii's first home, a 30 minute documentary for PBS Hawaii about the legacy of Hawaii's Queen Lilio Kulani and her personal home. She was the associate producer for the national PBS documentary, Patsy Mink, ahead of the majority, and a producer and director for the feature documentary, Finding Ku Khan, which was selected to be broadcast nationally on PBS World's, World's America Reframe series has won national multiple awards. We've worked with Robin as Historic White Foundation's primary filmmaker for a good 20 years, and she um, was selected by Historic White to produce and direct the Nancy Bannock photog photographic slide collection in 2021 and Nancy Bannock Saving Honolulu's Chinatown in 2022. We're going to show you this that film, um, Saving Honolulu's Chinatown. It's about 11 minutes long. And then immediately following the film, Robin will come on and share her thoughts. So just bear with me while I switch over to the film. Nancy Bannock is chairman of the Historic Buildings Task Force. Nancy, isn't this just about the smallest uh, restoration project you've undertaken? Well, probably so. Our, we've never really taken undertaken a restoration project as, as, a, <clears throat> as being a sponsor of it. We've been kind of a task force to get things done or get, a catalyst oftentimes to try to just pull all forces together mm -hmm. to see what could be done about mm -hmm. something. Nancy Bannock was basically nonstop energy. She was a, a little dynamo 
It's amazing how much she did. She's kind of like a bulldog. She won't let go, which is good. But we have not, we're not a membership organization or a foundation or an organization with money, right? She was at the forefront of photographing historic places, making other people aware of them. And that was a new thing for Hawaii. I'm a hands-on uh, cause fighter, let's put it that way. I moved to Honolulu in 1950, and um, within a short time, I was the Hawaii editor of Sunset Magazine, and I did a lot of wandering around this part of town. I started out being horrified by uh, what uh, urban renewal was starting to do. The Chinatown going back to the late 1800s into the 1960s was 10 times larger, stretching from Nimitz all the way to the H1. So when urban renewal came in, then the freeway came in, everybody got thrown out of Chinatown. Everything from Queen Emma Street over all the way to Lubiha was demolished, and basically from Vineyard to uh, Baratana. The, the area was just completely stripped. There used to be schools, uh, churches, temples, lots of housing. All of it was just flattened in the name of progress. Our family got dislocated because of urban renewal. It gave government a chance to clean up the city, make the city look nicer, not have so many ugly buildings, lean to wooden structures, and a lot of people that did not look like what one would imagine America would look like. For the first time, the United States is making a nationwide commitment to make the city a better place to live. For the first time ever, all the problems of urban living are being attacked at once. Slums, traffic, pollution, and crowding. Urban renewal was not a local phenomenon. It was a nationwide federal program Federal funds were available to support it, and the idea behind it was good. To give new life to the central city, Pittsburgh built an important downtown commercial center. Hartford built a great plaza above the streets. The problem was that it was somewhat indiscriminate, like a lot of these programs are. There was a lot of redevelopment in Chinatown. And, and all across the country, not just Honolulu. Uh, some of the redevelopment projects did not work very, very well. The idea of, of displacing all these people and putting up Kuhio Park Terrace type structures was just awful to me. The redevelopment plans are heartless, unfitting, insensitive, sterile, unimaginative, without character, and perhaps economically unsound. In all America, old Honolulu is something very special. Yet our planners and city officials apparently don't appreciate it enough to help it survive. I think there was a lot of pushback and Nancy was really important in kind of leading that pushback at the time. Well, I think Nancy's view was slow down, take a look. Don't just willy-nilly 
destroy something because you think a concrete high rise is a better use of the land. May 24th, 1966. A task force of the Mayor's Action for Beautification Committee objects to the plan to erect circular apartment towers connected by gardens between Mauna Kea, River, Baritania, and King Streets. The task force seeks an ordinance to create preservation districts in the city. The idea of a district was something kind of new. The National Historic Preservation Act was passed in 1966. The federal government then created the National Register of Historic Places. Chinatown individually, those buildings, almost none of them would have made it to be considered for the National Register as individual buildings. But when you put them all together, the architectural sense that you get there because of how similar they were built and when they were built and the materials that were used made them valuable together. Nancy wasn't the only person involved. She was one of the bullets in the gun that ended up turning that into a historic district but she was one of the bullets. The Pauahi Urban Renewal Project should be reconsidered by City Council. Also, the ill-advised widening of New Wanu Avenue and King Street, still shown on the general plan, would wipe out rows of our finest old buildings. It was like it was a drumbeat to get rid of this place. And it was a real battle. It really was. There wasn't a compromise. She didn't start out with compromise in mind. But you only get that way if you really feel the people and the history of a place. It was part of the history of all the different people who lived here, different ethnic groups who came in. It was the area of first settlement for immigrants when they moved, if they either came directly in some cases, or also moved off plantations to come into town. They generally ten tended to settle in this part of town. And um, uh, it was just, I mean, you just don't do away with all that and put up a bunch of 20th century uh, high-rise buildings or something like that. You know, it just, it just destroys everything. It's kind of the last remnant of Chinatowns that existed all over Hawaii. You know, there was a Chinatown in Hilo, there was one in Lihui, there was one in Lahaina, and they served the same purpose. They were a place where immigrants could come, make their way, transition into the society as a whole, and then invite more people to come. Do you have a favorite area in Chinatown? Well, I love Mauna Kea, New Uwanu, and Smith very much, and some of the cross streets, too. And they're, they're very real, and they haven't really changed a whole lot. We're going to have more and more people uh, appreciating what we have here. What's your yeah. hope for this next generation? That they pick up the ball and run with it? Or what, what's your hope for that? Well, I would hope that we would get people who cared enough about something, you know, to get in there and, and make themselves heard and fight for it. Make some, make some noise about it and really you know, get in there and fight for it.
Oh, mahalo, everyone, and aloha kako. Um, I just was kind of like wowed by Kirsten's talk and so grateful for all of the preservationists who came before and um, worked alongside Nancy Bannock. Um, so what I am going to do now is share my screen and start a slideshow to um, talk about like my relationship to Nancy as a preservation pioneer. I'm not a professional historian or a professional architect, but I do have a great appreciation for both history and architecture. So that's kind of where I come um, to Nancy and this topic. So wait, let me get my share screen going. I'm starting a little ahead of myself. Okay, so uh, the first thing that you should know is that I did not uh, ever get to meet Nancy. And so I have to thank the Historic Hawaii Foundation and Nancy's photographs themselves for introducing me to her. I, I first um, came across her when I was doing research for another film and trying to find pictures of uh, Ala Park in its old incarnation as a um, place that they had political rallies and where um, there are a number of SROs for uh, bachelors who live there. And um, I, I was fascinated that she was one of the few people who documented that place and that at that time. And then um, when the Historic Hawaii Foundation contacted me and let me know that they were um, in the process of cataloging and digitizing the color slides that Nancy had left them, um, I jumped at the chance to do a little film about that process. And when I was looking at those color slides, I really fell in love with Nancy's work and wanted to know more about her. So when the opportunity to do a film um, about Chinatown, preserving Chinatown came along, I jumped at it. And so, um, the film that you just saw doesn't really <laughs> tell you everything I learned about Nancy um, through her letters and her photographs and other people who shared their stories about her. So one of the things that really struck me about her was how intrepid she was and what a um, tireless photojournalist she was. So she was an avid bike rider and tennis player. And as you can see, she was also a very proud Republican which means a little bit different these days, but um, nevertheless, that uh, was something that she wore on her sleeve along with her passion for preserving uh, places um, and communities in Hawaii. Um, so one of the other things I noticed was that she, you know, she drove around in this little Volkswagen. I think she had different incarnations of this Volkswagen, but was known to always have a Volkswagen. And her, um, automobile shows up in a lot of her photographs, if you know how to look for them. So um, this is an example of how intrepid she was. I mean, she she's in the photo, her car's in the photo. She probably staged the photo and got somebody else, or maybe she put it on a timer, the, the, the camera. Um, so um, I also want to give a shout out. I'm kind of jumping around, but I wanted to give a shout out to the archives that exist that she contributed to that informed my storytelling about Nancy. And this is a screenshot of Ulu Ulu Moving Image Archive, which is where the interviews that I pulled from um, of Nancy Bannock talking about historic preservation came from. And there are a number of other um, interviews on that site that have Nancy speaking. So I encourage you all to explore this site if you have any interest in his, in the history of Hawaii. It's just a fascinating resource. And then um, I have a sh to give a shout out to the Hawaii State Archives, which um, Nancy was very familiar with. She worked closely with the Hawaii archivist Nancy, I mean, sorry, Agnes Conrad, too, who was a very like-minded preservationist. And so I think Nancy had a um, great appreciation for archives and that her own work was valuable and so she put together these black and white photo albums that are at the Hawaii State Archives. And those photo albums are uh, how I drew a lot of the visual material for the 
film on Chinatown. And um, I think you can see Nancy's own handwriting in these, these um, albums that tell a story. I mean, I think one of the things I grew to appreciate about Nancy is that she was a storyteller. You know, she was a journalist first and foremost, but she was also, um, you know, a photojournalist. So she tells stories with her photos. And in these albums, she took she took great pains to arrange the photos and kind of narrate what they were. And she also had a great um, appreciation for her work as being valuable to the future because she was meticulous about, if you can see in small print, she's numbered each of the prints and those numbers correspond to an uh, actual negative, a photo negative. So if you needed to blow up a picture, theoretically, I never tried this, but theoretically you could search the negative at the archives and have a photo blown up. Um, so she was very cognizant about the um, value of her photographs and how future generations might use them. So here's a picture of workers from the Historic Hawaii Foundation who um, are taking her slides to the Hawaii State Archives. So Hawaii, um, Nancy donated her color slides to the Historic Hawaii Foundation because I think at the time when she passed away, um, the State Archives didn't have capacity for them. So um, I was able to follow this uh, digitization preservation effort of her slides. And here's a shot of just one of those slide boxes. And you get an idea of how meticulous Nancy was as a cataloger of her own work. And you see um, her own labeling of architects, churches, um, locations. Uh, not every slide is actually written on, but she grouped them together in these boxes. And um, I am going to spend the rest of the program showing you a little sample of her color photography. And basically I broke it down into like three themes and how her photography struck me as a filmmaker and somebody who's interested in historical topics. Um, so uh, one of the things I wanted to point out before I, I I begin this section is that Nancy photographed in black and white and in color simultaneously. I saw similar shots of Chinatown in black and white and in color. And for photographers out there who, who know about the days before cell phones, uh, taking a black and white camera and a color camera with you everywhere is, you know, and she was a small woman, is a physical task, you know, it's not as simple as just switching an app. And so that's the, you know, the other thing that I, I really appreciate about Nancy and her documentation effort. So Holly Eva is, this section I put together because Holly Eva is a place that I visited in my childhood. I was born in 1960, but um, didn't return to Hawaii until 1965. Uh, when my father retired from the Air Force. So um, a lot of uh, the photographs that Nancy took are of scenes of my childhood that have disappeared. And so Holly Eva, her work of Holly Eva, to me speaks of her work in documenting a lifestyle that is disappearing and is quickly disappearing like Chinatown was. And um, I think that you can see in these photographs that she took great pains to really highlight very humble, modest buildings that maybe nobody else was really paying attention to. And I think that her preservation work made her cognizant of how fleeting and valuable these little buildings would were. And, um, the other thing I appreciate about these photographs is that also you get a sense of other things that maybe she was didn't intend to photograph, like the cars and um, the lifestyle. Um, I was uh, it was 
fascinating to learn about the bridge preservation work of Haleiwa Bridge, which I didn't know about. And so it's interesting that I think of that as just like a given for Haleiwa. And the reason why I like that picture is because after it, you see all these fishing boats that um, tell about a lifestyle, old style lifestyle that has changed so much. Um, and I believe this temple still exists, but um, that too may be another a thing that is less in use these days. Uh, just the street scenes of Haleiwa are, you know, it's so different now, as many of you know, um, and crowded with traffic. And there you can see Nancy's little Volkswagen in the shot. <laughs> So for me, these are super precious, these photos. Um, they really hearken to a time that doesn't exist anymore. And the harbor, my um, we, the reason why I visited Haleiwa so much is because my father had a friend with a fishing boat. So we did spend quite a bit of time at the harbor, but trying to get a shot of the harbor from the water just shows that Nancy, you know, went out of her way to get shots that would that would express a greater story. And so she must have had somebody get her out on a boat. And here you see, she must have had somebody uh, take her on a plane to get that shot of Haleiwa from the air. And these shots are so valuable these days um, to show the how much that this district has changed. Um, Ralph, do you have any comments about this section of photos? Is it a lot of things that are in the photo, the bridge, for example, there are numerous examples of the this type of bridge throughout the U.S., but here uh, in its setting, it's really special to us. So that, that's what I en uh, enjoy about this uh, trip down memory lane. Thanks. Okay, so um, this is, oh, oh, sorry, did I show you this? This is the other thing that I was uh, just, um, it's so cool that she paid attention to these kinds of sites that, you know, a lot of people would just pass right by, but she stopped and, and composed a nice photograph of this cemetery that I'm not sure still exists or is able to be seen anymore. Um, so the next, uh, by the way, she also took uh, similar photographs of other plantation towns like Waipahu and Wahiwa and yeah, I, I encourage all of you to explore her work at the State Archives. So this next section um, I put in because it gives an example of both Nancy's work on the Outer Islands, but also that she was concerned with not just um, old buildings and plantation lifestyle, but new construction. And you'll see that she took pictures of the Ka'anapali Resort as it was being constructed. Um, so the people who are into architecture and construction might be interested in these, but I just find it fascinating to think about her as a person who's who has such a wide interest in Hawaii's trend as a, you know, as a place and how quickly it's transitioning that she's um, taking pictures of construction sites as well as old plantation buildings. Um, and for anyone who visited Maui lately, these are these have become historic photographs. Like this pristine beach, unfortunately, is no longer. And so that's also, you know, the our our landscape is also something else that is inadvertently being documented and has become a valuable historical record. That you know, just might makes my heart kind of raw, ache to see that beach. Okay, so here's another thing that um, that she returned to the same site to photograph over time. So. Um, it's interesting that, that uh, there's a number of places besides Kaanapali and Chinatown that she did that. So, you know, it's just her her perseverance as a photojournalist is, is quite remarkable to me. 
And here's a picture of the hotel as after it's finished. I believe this is in the 70s. And another one of the finished product. Um, oh, before we move on to my next section, uh, love to get Ralph, um, any thoughts you have about those last section of photographs? Well, you know, these were um, new builds when Nancy was taking these pictures, but now they're coming into the age where they are the types of buildings that we're trying to preserve. So it's, um, in a sense, Nancy's providing the basis uh, the historical basis for our modern day uh, preservation uh, efforts in, you know, the mid-century modern sort of buildings. Well, that's um, a lead into my next section, which I'm going to go through kind of fast on the PowerPoint. But the next section I put together are um, a sampling of uh at the time, they were contemporary architects in Hawaii, contemporary to when Nancy was taking the photographs. A lot of times she took photographs of buildings right after they were completed in the 60s and 70s. And um, so in her arrangement of her slides, I got to see the works of a few architects, some, um, a couple I knew of, but a couple I didn't know of at all. And so to me, the the work, her photography work, helped to showcase um, both the work of these these uh, architects, contemporary architects to her, but also to speak to um, my built environment as I grew up on Oahu, the, you know, the built environment that I sort of took for granted, I appreciated anew as I went through these photographs of hers. And I also began to appreciate the work of single architects or single architectural firms. So Asipop, of course, is known mostly for his IBM building, but um, in Nancy's work, um, I got to see detailing of his residential things, also his other commercial buildings. And um, as I went through the, his photographs of his work, I began to see um, motifs and um, I guess what you might call our signature style of his designs. And um, it's a, just a chance to learn more, for me, an opening into learning more about Asipov and appreciating his work. Um, these like I said, these photographs were taken often when the building was brand new. So you get to see sort of the building as maybe the architect conceived of it without other buildings crowding the landscape around it. And um, help it helps help me to gain a new appreciation for some of these buildings. You get to also appreciate how much work was done. This is the Outrigger Canoe Club. Uh, Nancy, by the way, lived in Waikiki most of her life. I believe maybe all of her life in Hawaii. So I think she had special um, appreciation for Waikiki buildings. Um, so uh, what I was gonna say is it gave me an appreciation of how much was built in the 60s and 70s, really. Like how much build new buildings were going up. Um, so this next architect I didn't know about before, Edwin Bauer, um, but I learned um, after looking at these photographs that he came to Hawaii from California, it was a classmate of Roy Kelly's, who Roy Kelly was famous for the Outrigger hotel chain. And um, Edwin Bauer, um, I love this building, the Continental Building. I think this um, is a wonderful building. Anyway, um, Edwin Bauer, was known for building um, and designing low rise hotels with interior courtyards that are landscaped and also um, similar condo complexes, low rise condo complexes that remain really popular today. So the Breakers is one of his hotels. And um, I think the Ma Makikian 
is one of the condos that still exists that is a desirable building and um, still using the natural trades and, and open design concept um, for Hawaii. And then the, the other wonderful thing is that um, you get to see in these slides um, his work with churches. And uh, that's something that I, I tell you the truth, don't pay that much attention to, but um, there's so many great church designs. Now I realize that really it's like an opportunity to appreciate um, these buildings. Uh, again, seeing a building without crowd, the crowded skyline, it just gives you a new appreciation for it. And here's one of the, um, I think this is a condo complex. Now I want to look at, <laughs> go house hunting for these condos <laughs> that Edwin Bauer designed. Um, and this last grouping is, I think, um, the uh, architectural firm that had the most, one of the most amounts of slides, I had to winnow it down. And uh, of course, Blaisdell is some the building that already existed when I moved back to Hawaii. So many of these buildings already existed, but they have been brand new. And so it's kind of like a wake up, like, wow, the, you know, before I moved to Hawaii, this, this was all non-existent and it all had to be built. And this is, these are buildings that I just took as given buildings. HIC, this reminded me that it used to be called the Honolulu International Center, HIC, not the Blaisdell. Um, anyway, I'm just gonna kind of go quickly through these automobile showrooms. They, I mean, they built, they built and designed so much um, that we are familiar with if you grew up on Oahu or spent time on Oahu. This is another iconic building, the bank building. Um, I saw they're doing like a uh, renovation or restoration work on the concrete in this building right now. So yeah, these buildings are all either, some of them have, as Ralph pointed out to me earlier, have been destroyed already. And some that we see as historic are are being um, renovated or restored or um, preserved. Yeah, this is the YMCA in its early days without any buildings around it. So um, remarkable. And the Bishop Museum Planetarium. Um, I just love this, these shots of these car dealerships because and I never really appreciated the building before. And then, of course, you get to see all these wonderful vintage cars. And Pacific Club is the other real famous building. I think that was put up in 1960. And I think we're... So is at the Bishop Museum and oh my gosh, and there's so many. Oh, and we're ending at um, a, a Chinatown icon, Mark's Garage. So that's the end of my slideshow. Um, oh, sorry, Ralph, did you want to talk about any of those slides that I quickly over. Just your thoughts that um, you know we we focus in on people like C. W. Dickey and Hart Wood, but it's it's nice that Nancy Bannock was able to take photographs and catalog uh, the works of uh, other architects who uh, are not remembered as much today. So that that's uh, very valuable and. You know, the, this is a parking structure, uh, and yet it's become uh, sort of an icon in the art world in Chinatown that really um, was able to 
be in that because of the design that the architects uh, put into the structure. So Nancy um, is giving us the chance to, to look back across, across the time that she was recording these and understanding the, the uses that they were making. I'm gonna stop my share. Yeah, so I think that one, one of the things that points out to me Nancy's visionary work is that she did document contemporary buildings that today now are you know, valuable. And her work, her work has, to me, has become much more valuable over time. And that she saw that that future value of her work um, would happen and that she took great pains to archive her work is something that I, as a filmmaker, greatly appreciate. And um, I don't think everybody who, who, um, photographs or who is interested even in preservation has that vision that she had to do that. So thanks that I think that we can open it up for Q and A now, Andrea. Oh, can you speak? Oh, I have to read this. Uh, Andrea, it's helpful if you say it because I can you speak? Sure. Do, you, do you want me to screen is super it? small? So I can't read okay, that. thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk and slideshow. We have several questions coming in. Um, let's start with the one from Phil, Phil Dieters. Did Nancy have a chance to photograph the buildings turned down to build Mark's garage? I don't know if we know the answer to that or not. I don't even. I don't know what was torn down to build Mark's garage, but coincidentally, my ancestor, Lee Alo, had a store at that location, um, Nuuanu and chaplain lane i think so no i have i haven't seen any what was there before but i know that nancy did photograph the um alexander young hotel before it was destroyed and um or in the midst of being destroyed you know broken windows and the you know all of that so that's um in her color slide work i haven't seen all of nancy's photos by any means. So I don't know. She might have. Ralph, did you have anything to add to that? I, I haven't seen any um, older photos by Nancy. She was looking at things that were still surviving. But the archives is just full of pictures of buildings that uh, are no longer around. And it, it's like if um, if you had a time machine and went back to these times, I don't think you'd recognize what, where you were. Uh, you wouldn't be able to uh, get your bearings because uh, whole swaths of buildings are gone. Uh, the ones that we have, the um, the ones that we think of as really gems, uh, had many other examples. Uh, I know that uh, across from Mark's Garage, just across Chaplin Lane was the location of uh, Rook House, where Queen Emma uh, lived. And that uh, became the Liberty Theater. That was torn down. And now you just have a, a parking lot, an open parking lot uh, that's replaced them. So yeah, it's, um, to the extent that you can preserve photos of uh, buildings that you know are going to be gone, uh, I think you're contributing to at least a memory of that preservation. Thank you for that, Ralph. We have a couple of comments from Cami about how we can um, self-curate. We can we can use our smartphones now and document, but as you've all expressed, Nancy had to carry her equipment around and really had to curate and think about what she was doing. Um, there's another question. Um, Robin, can you speak more, or Ralph, about Nancy's trajectory from documenter as a photojournalist to activist and preservationist? Was um, the potential destruction of Chinatown the main catalyst? I believe so. I um, 
I know that Nancy was the photo editor, Hawaii photo editor for Sunset Magazine. And I believe Sunset, the people at Sunset were also interested in architectural preservation. So um, she might have already had that in her brain when she landed in Hawaii in 1950. But uh, I think that she really, in those albums, you see that she spent a lot of time in Chinatown and she really got to know the community there. So I think she took it real personally when urban renewal started wiping that district out. And her activism, her organized activism started at that time when she banded together with other like-minded people to to create the task force, preservation task force. And then as a group, they started taking on other projects uh, besides Chinatown. And, and, you know, she was a founding member of Historic Hawaii Foundation. So, you know, all of the projects basically that were birthed by the, the preservation projects birthed by the Historic Hawaii Foundation sort of like took off from, from that founding of, you know. So, um, I, I think that that spurred on maybe her her photography work because her photographer photography work went far and wide, way beyond what Sunset would have asked of her to do. Ralph, do you have anything to add to that? I just think that it, it's it's hard to photograph things, and when you see them start to disappear, I think that's when you get that uh, drive to try to preserve things. Um, you know, right now in, in Chinatown, you see a lot of empty buildings. And I suspect with the rail coming through and transit-oriented development, uh, there is a definite chance for more destruction in Chinatown to occur. Uh, as a... Uh, I was reading an ad in the Star Bulletin that comes up on my feed, and there are um, the bungalows uh, that are being auctioned off by the GSA um, on the military base. So it's um, and we have preservation laws in place. Uh, we have uh, the the possibility of protection of these places but it's still a constant uh, battle to continue what Nancy Banning started. It's um, the fight is not over yet. And you're seeing it with a lot of the development that is still occurring in Chinatown. Thank you, Ralph. That's an important point. Um, I know that Kirsten, I don't know if she wants to jump on now and say anything about that, but I think you would be best to speak about that. You know, yeah, thank you, Ralph, for bringing that up. Just last Friday, I was in a meeting. We have monthly meetings with the Honolulu Transit Project, and um, some of the staff members from the Department of Planning and Permitting were there to talk about their transit-oriented development plans and some of the development proposals that are proposed for parcels in Chinatown. And it got a little heated. I mean, Historic White Foundation thinks we should preserve Chinatown and transit oriented development people think we shouldn't. So, you know, as you said, this is an ongoing battle. It, it continues. And um, it, you know, it's not for the weak apart. We we all need to decide what matters and, and, you know, make our best efforts to preserve them. And I would say Chinatown is in that category. You also mentioned Fort Kamehameha at um, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, and it's another one where the Navy is proposing to demolish 30 historic buildings from pre-World War I. And again, we are trying to stop that, but we're up against the forces of the United States military, and you know that's not an easy place to be. So yes, when I, when I think about Nancy and the example she set, a great deal of it was just perseverance. And after setback, after setback, after setback, I, I think Dorothy Pyle in the film said it's a drumbeat. That drumbeat continues. So that's why, you know, it's important that we have a community of preservationists, that we have people that believe that this is important and to convey that to decision makers, because otherwise it'll all be gone. Thank you for that, Kirsten. 
Um, can you also, Kirsten, can you just share a little more about how the archive, how the Nancy Bannock, which is now part of the Hawaii State Archives that Robin so beautifully captured in her, her short film and the digitization of that collection, how did how did we end up, how did Historic Hawaii Foundation receive those? You know, this is interesting because Historic Hawaii Foundation is not an archive. You know, we have our own records and, and projects that we've worked on and pictures we've taken for ourselves and projects we've done for ourselves, but we are not set up to curate or care for archival materials, right? And so it's very unusual for us to accept that kind of um material or donation, they really do belong with real archives, the state archives or the Hawaiian Historical Society or the Bishop Museum or any of the historical societies on the on the uh, neighbor islands. In this case, when um, during Nancy's lifetime, she had donated quite a few of her materials, her scrapbooks, her photos, her negatives to the state archives. And when she passed away, they were all supposed to go there. And at the time, I think Robin mentioned that there was a capacity issue and the state archivist at the time basically cherry picked what he wanted to accept and and what they wouldn't. And these boxes and boxes of two by two transparency slides were not accepted. And so the executors of the estate actually contacted us and said, if you don't want them, they're going into the dumpster because the, the real archives won't take them and we don't know what to do with them and we can't, you know, hold on to them. So, you know, come, come down and get them or they're gone. And of course I went down and got them because who, you know, who would let those go into the dumpster. And then they lived in our office for, you know, 10 years and nobody ever looked at them. And they I felt horrible guilt every time I walked into the room. And so um, a few years ago, we the state archives got a new archivist. And so I called Dr. Jansen and said, hey, you want these? And he said, of course, I want them. And from there, we we were able to transfer them to the state archives. Um, and then at the time, um, we also received a grant from the Hawaii Council for the Humanities to pay for their digitization. So we worked with the um, University of Hawaii Community Design Center to send archival interns to the state archives to actually digitize this collection. So it was a great um, success story in the end, but it, it took a while to get there. So that's the story. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And uh, earlier in the chat, if you all save your chats um, or you can look on our website, there's a link to and instructions on how to access the, the archives from the Hawaii State Archives uh, website. Um, I'd like to just share a comment from Laura Ruby, who knew Nancy Bannock. She said Nancy was extremely helpful with Mo'ili Ili, the life of a community, starting in 2002, and she gave a large donation for the printing. She said, quote, take any of the photos you can use, unquote, end quote. She also freely gave her images to Ross Stevenson and Laura Ruby for their book, Honolulu Town. And she was instrumental in their efforts for geckos in paradise. Today, Ishizuchi Jinja is being threatened. And she's, Florida's asking, can anyone save it? Kirsten, did you want to add to that? Uh, you nodded your head, the life, um, the life of, the, of a community. I'm not familiar with that. I don't know if Robin or Ralph is, but. I'm, I am familiar with it. It's a beautiful book, very well done. and. Um, you know, I started at Historic White Foundation in 2006. Nancy passed away in 2008, I believe. And so we just had a couple of years of overlap. Um, and she was actually our newsletter editor at the time. And she was meticulous and fierce. And boy, did she like to, to yell at me a lot. Um, and I think a lot of people remember her as just being kind of uncompromising. I believe is how Glenn Mason described her. And, and abrasive at times. But she had such a generous spirit and heart, and she was supportive of, you know, these community efforts and these preservation efforts, but also Hawaii Public Radio and the symphony and other arts and cultural organizations. And she really did give to the whole community with her whole heart. And I think these individual stories help capture that. And, and some of that's part of her legacy as well. Mm, thank you for that. Robin, and then Ralph, do you have any, um, we're at one o'clock, do you have any last wrap up words? And then we will just give you a quick reminder about what's coming up next week. 
No, I just want to, uh, you know, express my gratefulness again for, um, you know, the opportunity to learn about Nancy and also comment that I, I love historical films and I tend to do films about strong women, but they I usually do it after they've passed away. And I realize that probably I would be intimidating intimidated about approaching someone like Nancy when she was still alive. So, um, but I, I, I tend to really appreciate those types of women, those, the kinds of women who would intimidate me in real life. <laughs> those are the ones I choose to make films about. Thank there's you. A, there's a book called A, a Close Call. Uh, it was about Chinatown and Nancy Bannock. Uh, I believe David Cheever was the author on that. And it's um, it's still a close call. I mean, it, it the book seems to indicate that here was a close call. Um, we've got around it. But preservation is always an action you need to continue to take. And I'm glad that the Historic Hawaii Foundation is around to help uh, in that effort. Excellent words. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating, to everyone in the audience for your questions and engagement and excitement for what we just received from our presenters. And we invite you to join us next week, next Wednesday, every Wednesday on February 7th for when um, Bill Chapman will present on William J. Murtaugh. So if you haven't yet registered, please do so and um, feel free to sign up for Historic Hawaii's um, e-newsletter at historicway.org. And thank you for supporting and thank you for caring about preserving these places. We can't do it alone. We have to do it together. Ahui ho. Everyone. Mahalo. Mahalo. Oh, I'm sorry. Mahalo to Michelle Kisik, our wonderful um, development program manager who is doing backup in tech. Appreciate that. And all of you. Mahalo yako. Mahalo.